Hey everyone, Mario again, coming at you with another movie review. And as you can tell from the title up there, it is the second entry in the Planet of the Apes reboot series, Dawn of the Planet of the Apes. Now, unofficially, this is an episode a second time around, because while I have seen the film before, I didn't get a chance to review it, because I saw it for the first time a couple years ago, when it was about a year old, and I was in Florida, and I didn't have a chance to sit down and actually review it. But I enjoyed the film, and going and watching it again, now that another the next film in the series is out, I have to say I still enjoy it. And I have to say, out of the reboot series thus far, this is my favorite. This is definitely the best overall reboot they've made of the three of them I've actually seen. Not, you know, counting the Burton remake in there, because it is its own unique series, not connected to the original films. And this might be a little premature, but after thinking over it a little bit, I have to say this is my favorite and the best Apes film overall since Escape from the Planet of the Apes. And I have to say, I probably enjoy it on par with that film. I mean, nothing is going to be as great as the original film. Just from the fact that ending alone has so much shock value and was so impactful in the history of cinema. Nothing else about a film is going to be able to top that. How could you top you, maniacs? Damn you! Now you can come close, but nothing will top it. The most that you'd probably be able to do is equal it overall with everything else, but that ending is still going to put it a little bit over the top, at least for me. But on par with Escape is not bad, because Escape is usually looked at as the best out of all the sequels. Even though there is kind of that little weird thing between beneath in it but i've already talked about that now the film is directed by matt reeves who before this was known for cloverfield a film that i actually need to watch one of these days even though i've edited with footage from it and let me in a vampire movie i do need to watch also and he also directed the new film too but that's after it and just watching his direction uh, it does definitely wants makes me want to watch his older films a little bit because i could definitely say he's a good director I don't know if one of these days he'll be winning any Oscars, but if he does get nominated for him at least, just based on this film, I can see it because he knows how to work the camera. He knows how to get great performances out of his actors. And if whatever scenes that involved action, he filmed it competently. And I think it also helps that he had an excellent cinematographer with him, Michael Surison, who is known for... The third Harry Potter film, Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban, which is not only one of my favorite Harry Potter films, but I have to say is probably the one that has the best cinematography, because it is a little bit darker than its predecessors, and uh, I'll save the rest of my thoughts for when I actually review the films. And he wasn't the main cinematographer on this, but he did some additional cinematography work on Gravity. Uh, the musical score was done by Michael, and I'm probably going to butcher this name because it's Italian and sometimes the pronunciations are a bit weird. Giacchino. If I'm butchering that, I apologize again. Who, uh, other than this film, this is just a brief list of the films he's done scores for. He did a score for The Incredibles, Ratatouille, all three of the Star Trek reboot films, Let Me In, and Cloverfield, which is probably how he got to new Matt Reeves, and Reeves knew, was like, oh, I'll have him do the score. Rogue One, Spider-Man Homecoming, and the big feather in his cap is the one he won an Academy Award for Best Original Score for, Up. And I can honestly say, just based on those scores, he's an excellent composer, and his score for here, while it is subtle compared to his work in, say, The Incredibles or uh, Ratatouille, it's there and it complements the tone of the film well. Now, the plot of the film is it picks up 10 years after... The previous film. The simian flu was spread across the world. Human civilization collapsed, which the credit sequence really nails us on by showing how the virus spread. And we hear a voiceover of all the tragedies that have befallen humanity. Uh, the ape society is still living in the woods outside of San Francisco. Uh, they've had years of peace because the humans haven't bothered them because, you know, they've been too busy dealing with their own civilization collapsing. And uh, they wonder if they're actually dead. There's a little conversation from a recent Caesar talking, like, been 10 winners. Haven't seen any of the last couple. Well, things change when a couple humans are going through the woods. They are part of the colony that is setting itself up in the remains of San Francisco. 
and they're going through the woods to try to find a dam there to turn it on because they've been using gasoline generators and uh, you can kind of see where this is going because no human civilization on the level that we had it before no gasoline because no oil drillers no gasoline no generators to run electricity so their dam is the only hope but it takes them through ape territory of course there's a little misunderstanding at first when one of the apes gets shot but not killed caesar you know you know he's the one that makes the shots with the apes they want to attack a couple of the humans think they should open fire one of the other humans malcolm who's played by jason clark manages to talk the rest of the humans into not firing caesar lets them go and he returns a bag that one of them dropped in their quick escape to leave and tells them human home points to the woods ape home now after talking with gary oldman's character dreyfus malcolm actually goes into the woods by himself oh he takes some people with him but he goes up to the apes home by themselves and begs Caesar to let them run the dam. Caesar agrees, but there is some dissension, mainly from the character of Koba. And those of you who have seen the first of the reboot films recognize this as the Bonobo who was the main experiment in the second run of ape trials that happened in the lab. The one that was the uh, lab ape that's used to protocol. The one that ends up killing our businessman character by pushing him off the bridge. Now, he is just filled with hate for humans. Every time there's a discussion about humans, he really puts forward that they shouldn't help him or they should kill him. And as Caesar puts it at one point in the movie, all the humans ever taught Koba was hate. And uh, his little argument about Caesar is that Caesar's weak and that Caesar loves humans and he's going to give them always the benefit of the doubt. Yet the counter to that is that Koba, you let your own bias against humans because of what they did to you get in the way of your judgment and cloud your judgment. Just because they're human doesn't mean they're necessarily bad. Just like on the reverse, we have some humans that hate apes. Like one of the characters that goes up to ha help with the dam, he seems to hate apes in general. Like, Samian flu! Apes! He does get he does get killed by Koba. That's a mild little spoiler there. But just shows prejudice works both ways. And if there's anything that this film really does uh, play up is the whole prejudice thing. You know, apes don't like humans. Humans don't like apes. They have to work together. To get the dam running at one point though and that's the one strength of the planet of the apes series whether you, if you look at all the films is that it tackles social things first film a little bit was uh, the whole red scare i mean the whole kangaroo court why are all apes created equal well, from what i've seen some apes are more equal than others and the whole class issue second film more like it was a vietnam allegory which is a little bit more on the nose third film Another little social one. Fourth one, about slavery and uh, also the class system. Last one was about, uh, if you want to look at it from an allegorical, metaphorical perspective, it's that we all should stick together as, and that we shouldn't let, uh, the way I look at it anyway, we shouldn't let ethnicity and racial boundaries cloud our judgment. You know, any boundaries, religion, race, we shouldn't let them cloud our judgment. Here, there is a little bit of that. Which is fitting because this film is, in a sense, a remake of the last film in the original series, Battle for the Planet of the Apes. Just like its predecessor was, at its core, a remake of Conquest of the Planet of the Apes. Which just, you know, the plots changed and, you know, I'd say better special effects. Because that's the one thing that the later Apes films were kind of scant on, is they didn't have as much elaborate stuff. Well, none of the, other than the makeup, none of the original Apes films had many elaborate stuff other than the map paintings, but... You can definitely see the budget for this film is there. It was made for about $235 million and it made $710.6, so it made its budget back. And of course, like any film that tackles that social... Like any film that tackles the subject matter I mentioned just a bit ago, there is going to be a struggle because Gary Oldman's character, he does not want to work with the apes, but he's going to give Malcolm the chance to do so. And of course, when the apes attack, mainly because Koba does a false flag by framing the human saying they killed caesar they go and basically take over the colony and they round up the humans and put them in a cell another thing for battle because aldo the evil ape in that film did the same thing to the humans when the mutant humans attacked and of course like that film you know that caesar and koba are gonna have to end up fighting and they even play it up because they do take another thing from battle and that is ape must never kill ape and uh, that leads to a dramatic moment at the end that I don't want to spoil, but it's a big emotional moment for Caesar. 
because if you watch if you're watching the whole film you know that this moment was coming and it is a moment that the film builds up well and it executes well and you watch it and you're like and of course as you could guess from that koba is the main is the main antagonist of the film but the secondary one is gary oldman and that mainly comes into play in the third act mainly when he wants to try and kill the apes for them taking over the colony i'm not going to go into that a lot because there's some spoilers there i don't want to touch in this video but it is a little bit of a moment and you understand why he's doing this he's a lot more understandable than koba is because koba's is just full-on hate i hate humans whereas oldman's it's he's trying to protect the colony and he doesn't want to listen to malcolm and he says something that a couple of the other human characters repeat throughout the film they're only animals it's just me having taken anthropology i'm just sitting there shaking my head like really if you'd actually studied uh, the great ape family tree you know that they are animals but they are intelligent animals and the, the apes in this movie even more so because of that uh, one thing they have human level intelligence instead of near human level intelligence so you should treat them with respect and uh, not to degrade them it's like how in the original film how some of the apes degraded taylor and then taylor at the end is like you kept me in a cage that was different we thought you were inferior there's that vibe so it's like mm, nice to have that back in the film series now uh, like with the first reboot film you had that little bond that was between james franco's character and caesar this film there's a bond between malcolm and caesar but there's also a secondary bond between malcolm's son and maurice the orangutan and it's a nice little moment that's set up from the beginning and as the film progresses it gets even bigger and they actually share a moment where they're actually looking over a book together and this punctuates itself when the false flag stop and starts and he actually looks at them all and goes run and of course it's fitting since uh, maurice is supposed to be the teacher character kind of like um i forget the name of the character from battle but he was an orangutan so fitting that maurice takes over that role and he's even the one that teaches the younger apes apes should not kill ape uh carrie russell plays ellie who is malcolm's wife and she does a pretty good job she's a medic so she comes into play a couple times one with caesar's wife cornelia which uh ori she originated with a deleted subplot from the first film which explained a little bit more why caesar went back to the uh, primate sanctuary but they deleted it and the only thing of her that remains is that, that she was at there so you can kind of see why she might fall for caesar and eventually have a family with him and of course her name obviously reference to cornelius from the original films and uh, she also plays a little bit of a role later on when she helps caesar uh, other than this the only other things i note she's done is the wonder woman directed dvd movie where she voiced the main character and bedtime stories those are the two big ones of note uh clark of course is known for zero dark 30 white house down and of course genesis terminator genesis where he played john connor he's one of the better things about that film and i definitely say he's <laughs> He's a lot better in this film. Andy Serkis and Gary Oldman, I don't even think I need to say what they've done. And uh, Andy Serkis, speaking of which, the only special feature on the DVD that I that it, there is, other than the trailers and other stuff, is about him playing Caesar in this film. And it's a nice little documentary. Uh, you know, all the other actors and the director complimenting him, stating that he approached this role like it's actually an acting role, not like just like acting like an ape in front of the camera we gotta put in the mannerisms of chimps but you approach it like a human role just adding in some of the mannerisms which good little policy to do and that's about really that's all there to that documentary it makes me want to get the blu-ray copy of the film more so i can see some more in-depth documentaries and hopefully listen to a commentary like i said i'm a sucker for special features on films i like even for some films i don't like i'd like to hear commentaries like there's a couple films it'd be interesting to hear the thoughts on like uh, I do want to get the Blu-ray for RoboCop 3 one of these days. It's just like, unlike RoboCop 2, it wasn't a, I gotta get it right now. Now, there's nothing really much else to say about the film. Definitely my favorite in the reboot series thus far. Like I said earlier, my favorite since Escape. Definitely comes with my recommendation, and I'm actually kicking myself I didn't see this in the theaters back in 2014. That's why I really want to get to the theater and see War for the Planet of the Apes, even though I hear it's more of a melodrama than a war film, but... With how the first two ones were, they were more dramas involving the apes, so that doesn't surprise me. But it'll probably be one where I like the second one the most, and the third one is in between the first and the second. We shall see.